You're listening to the World Football Program with all the latest updates from both local and international football. to the World Football Program, 107.9 FM. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for listening in. You can catch us live streaming on RadioFremantle.com or the MyTuna radio app in the studio this morning. Myself, Penny tanner in the driving seat with John O'Connell. Morning, John. Yeah, good morning, Pen, and I hope the program meets the approval of all our listeners out there today. <laughs> <laughs> Ratings are going to go up with you sitting in that chair, O'Connell. You reckon? <laughs> They might do. We'll see. Well, you never know, do you? It could go down, mate. Yeah, I've had a few people ask about uh, how we rate with the show. It's a bit of a tough one with community radio because being community, um, it costs a bit to get the the ratings um, rated, so to speak, to do the surveys. I think it's called a McNair survey that they... McNair Anderson. Yeah, that's the one. And it happens only every few years and it's done in conjunction with the other... Um, radio stations and we have Rose in the studio she's messing about with her microphone there I'm just going to turn it on so you can say hi okay Rose say hi to everyone hello Rose is going to read uh, out the women's fixtures a little bit later when we have Greg what a nightmare that's going to be oi oi she said (laughs) good on you Rose uh, about that McNair Anderson what we might do then next time in we might bring in some ratings on on Community radio. We can do that, yeah. They and, do and them. see how many people listen. You'd be surprised, actually. Every two or three years, I think, they do them here. Mm. And this show rates pretty highly. It's in the top handful around uh, West Australia and Australia. Um, we don't get exact figures because, unlike commercial uh, stations and networks, they don't have their um, sponsorships and their competitions and their, their rate-ometers in, in the same way. Yeah, but so not only that, it's... A, it's a costly exercise. It is, and we are and, community and some radio. Of the community radio stations can't afford it. And well, and it comes down to grants, government funding, donations, mm-hmm. memberships from people that listen in. Those kind of things keep us going. So we appreciate all of that, and uh, we do appreciate the people that partner and sponsor up with us. And our partners are uh, Gate and Fence Hardware WA, Oswest Fencing and Wrought Iron, Data Platts, Perth Glory. Rachel Pepper Illustrations, the Australian Mini Football Federation and, of course, Radio Fremantle. And any audio that you hear during the show is thanks to the major networks out there, ABC, SBS, uh, Fox Sports, Football Australia, and we have a club partner in Melbourne City Football Club. So, yes, you will hear those people on our station a bit more often than uh, others and we don't exclude anyone. So if you have some news that you want to share and it's... uh, it's good stuff for us all to hear, then give us a hoy and uh, we'll put it to air. We'll share, absolutely. You can give us your comments or questions for any of our guests that are coming up to this number. Keep it logged into your phone or iPad or whatever, 0417 
921. That is the station number. And I believe there's been a, a big request for uh, that that song, The Cleanest Little Piggy in a Market Pen. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> you haven't played yeah. that for a while. No, we haven't. I'm sure I've got it somewhere. There's somewhere. a few oink, oinks in that song. <laughs> <laughs> the guest on the show today, by the way, everyone, getting distracted. Um, Gary Morocchi from the Perth Soccer Club. Uh, Greg Farrell, who is the Beckenham Women's Premier League coach and also the assistant national women's futsal team coach. They've just had their World Cup over in Spain and Australia did very well. Thank you very much and we'll have a chat about that. Dave Kindness, the Melbourne City President, will be joining us and Mike Cockrell from the Sydney Morning Herald. A few things to say there about uh, international visiting teams and the like and they've got a great uh, knowledge of the Australian football landscape as Mike so we'll have a catch up with him and anything else that uh, comes up along the way I reckon. Yeah well I think Mike Cockrell the main theme is going to be a fair go. That's what he's going to be talking about and that's what he's already spoken about and written a, a great article in the Sydney Morning Herald a, a short while ago. Yes. And some people are, might dispute some of it, but I think that, you know, if we're going to push ahead, then we do need a fair go. We do need the support that every other sport gets. And I think really that's all Mike Cockrell is asking for, considering our sport is the uh, the, the number one sport now in Australia. Yeah, we have to keep telling people that and reminding ourselves that we are that. And what does that bring for us? What, exactly. does, that, what does that get for us? Does it bring... A, as much as the sports who are below us, does it bring us the same as that? It doesn't. Well, I don't know. I, I, the more the more time passes, John, and the more we have people saying that these things just are, we are the number one participation sport, we have this profile, blah, 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 the more I think, well, okay, let's just do it ourselves. Let's not keep relying on other people and expecting things when we are this growing mass of numbers and popularity. Let's just get in there and do it ourselves. Uh, maybe we'll ask Mike Cockrell how we can do it. <laughs> how we can go about it. Yep. Mm. Let's go to a break and come back and have a chat with Gary Morocchi, who is the president of the Perth Soccer Club. This is Penn and John and Rose in the studio. Back soon. The Perth Glory Football Club is proud to support WA Football and the World Football Program. Stay tuned on 107.9 FM every Saturday from 10am for the very latest Perth Glory news. A-League, W-League and youth, glory is ours. Station sponsor. The World Football Program welcomes the Australian Mini Football Federation onto Radio Fremantle. Join the growing numbers playing non-traditional forms of football at any of the Area 5 centres around Perth. Find out more on osminifootball.com. Station sponsor. Oswest Fencing and Wrought Iron. Our family fabricates fence panels, gates and framework, repairs gates and sets up automated systems. Ring us on 9258 6822 for old-fashioned family service and advice. Station sponsor. The team behind footballwa.net can boast the best independent local football website and football forums in WA. These are sites devoted entirely to promoting the local game and our history. Visit footballwa.net for the World Football Program guest lineup every Friday. Radio Fremantle, recognising volunteers who support football in the local community. And we'll go back to the World Football Program on 107.9 FM. Fremantle Radio, in the studio, myself, John O'Connell, Rosie Hove and uh, Penny Tanner, and uh, shortly we'll be catching up with uh, Gary Morocchi, and it could be interesting, actually, we were having a chat with Gary, not only about, obviously, our local game and how things are going, but also possibly the Association of Australian Football Clubs, which he is WA's representative when it gets off the ground, and um, apparently, well, there is round about... Uh, and this is the MPL, of course, National Premier League. There's around about 3,000 players who play in the MPL now, so they could become a force within their own rights, of course. So not, and I'm, I'm talking about looking after, you know, um, their part of football here in Australia. But it's uh, looking for a, a seat on the board of uh, of um, the FFA and uh, being sanctioned by FIFA, would you believe? 
And uh, it'll be interesting uh, to uh, hear Gary's thoughts on that again and when we can expect that to take off. Also, it's a big weekend in football, isn't it? So we've got uh, our local games after the FFA Cup last week where there were some shock surprises. And, of course, we're back to uh, our, our local leagues uh, once again. And, um, of course, we've got the FA Cup at Wembley tonight. At uh, 12:30 a.m. our time here in Perth, Rosie, are you going to be watching it? Yeah. You are going to be watching it. Good girl. And before that, mind you, uh, we've got the Scottish Cup final: Celtic versus Aberdeen. And uh, what about Celtic? This is their third trophy they're looking for, and they finished top of the table, undefeated all season, and finished with 100 points. Can you believe that? And the second or the runner-up was Aberdeen on. Uh, what was it, 30 points. So, um, certainly um, been a big uh, a big year for Celtic and um, hopefully they're going to add the Scottish Cup to their show tonight, although I think Aberdeen will give them a good run for the money. <laughs> I think we've finally got Gary on the line. Are you there, Gary? I am, Benny. Thank yes. you. Excellent. Thank you for joining us this morning. Appreciate your time. Not a problem at all. Yeah, morning, guys. Good morning, John. Now then, just quickly, uh, we had a conversation about the Association of Australian Football Clubs, of course, which is the NPL, not that long ago, and uh, you were obviously in, in the early days of that, so you're going to be representing uh, uh, from this state, from WA, uh, the NPL on that association. Has there been much more progress since, Gary? Um, the progress, obviously, before any uh, association going to be formed, uh, a constitution needs to be drafted and um, there is a lawyer in Melbourne that's currently uh, finalising that draft. It will then get distributed to all the states uh, for their input and then it'll obviously, I think it'll be ready by the end of uh, you know, June 2017. So hopefully there'll be an executive created um, just after that in early July with one representative from each state. So it's not going to be a uh, representation of just Sydney and Melbourne clubs, uh, where supposedly everyone thinks you know, the, uh, the better clubs are. It will be a, uh, an Australia-wide representation. And will there be a, an agenda on the table from all states, and obviously that will be looked at as part of the new concept? Well, the agenda currently, John, is to try to get a uh, higher level of competition for the NPL clubs. Uh, more than likely what that will be leading to is a, um, a second division of the uh, A-League, uh, possibly on a different format. How it runs is still to be determined, but uh, a lot of the clubs are certainly concerned that the NPL is not really getting the uh, support from the FFA that uh, that it should because uh, you know the the, stand, the competition needs a lot more financial support because if it, it doesn't get the support from the top you know the NPL clubs especially I know here in WA most of the clubs are under a lot of pressure. Gary, are we talking about uh, um, there's been conversations about the A League having their own uh, well separate organisation to the FFA to to run it and then we're talking about the NPL competition having an organisation to run it. So are we talking the same things? Like, so like the A-League and the NPL, which is you know, the second tier of the A-League, are going to be run by the same body but separate to the FFA? Is that what I mean? don't think so. I think it's obviously we are all part of uh, the uh, West Australian uh, organisation. All clubs are part of their member federations who are then members of the FFA. Obviously there's not going to be any sort of breakaway competition or league. We want to have... Um, I, I didn't okay. actually mean a, a breakaway, but maybe run just separately so they filter their own funds and sponsored monies into it and just take away some of the, the pressure and burden, I guess, from the FFA having to run it? Uh, possibly, but obviously it has to run under the same umbrella. And, sure. You know, everyone's got to be heading in the right direction. But, uh, you know, all NPL clubs throughout the country are all voicing their concerns about uh, player retention, younger players, being uh, taken away to the A-League club, what sort of compensation do they get, what sort of financial contribution is coming from the FFA to the NPL. You know, I'll just give you an example. In Western Australia, FFA, the NPL, gets, I think, $39,000 for the competition for Sony uh, to sponsor the NPL throughout Australia. Now, I think it's 250000 for the eight-member federations, and I believe... In 
everyone else that I've spoken to in the state believe that that amount of money is very small for the amount of exposure it's given to that organisation. So, you know, we're working together to try to get a better return for the club, which in turn will mean the competition will become better because we can afford to possibly have better quality players in the league. Hmm. And, um, you know, the 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 NPL now is, is obviously, um, you know, the backup now for the A-League. You know, all, all the players, all the good young players coming through our system here in Australia, well, obviously, a majority of them will come through the NPL. Is that uh, another area that needs to be discussed and, and obviously um, given a bit more respect to? I totally uh, agree with what you're saying, John, but you've got to look at the, the numbers. Currently, all the A-League clubs have a uh, playing roster of 23, and most clubs have on that roster of 23 five uh, supposedly over uh, six type players. That limits the number of players within the country to 18. Now, you have a think about how many junior players across this country. There's not that many spots available for younger players in, in this country, and... Uh, by having the uh, spread uh, of a second-tier competition at a higher level, it gives those younger players an opportunity to develop further into a higher level of competition. And, you know, A-League clubs are not going to take the risk on 17, 18-year-old lads on their professional roster. So, you know, having a second-tier competition worked uh, in conjunction with FFA, I think, is the way to go if you want to get further development of our younger players. Where do you think the um, the new... I don't know what to call the, the profile of state teams through Football West fits into the scheme of things, Gary. You know how we've uh, all, Football West has branded the state teams now, I think Black Swan, so if you play women's or youth or men, you have the same strip, the same logo, which I think is great. Um, teams go away, they're recognised as... Where do you think that fits into development, representation, recognition of players? Well, I don't... I mean, you, I'm just thinking of the men's side of things... Uh, the, the WA State team virtually has no competition other than playing for the glory at the end of the season. And uh, if, so I don't really think that's an effective way of uh, trying to improve the standard of the competition. I know the amateur team, I think, goes to um, Singapore or, or Malaysia in the off-season. But uh, in regards to the highest tier of competition, which is the men's NPL, um, unless the state team plays interstate, uh, state, you know, goes interstate and plays South Australia, Victoria, other or tours, um, it's not to have really any impact at all. Yeah. But to create that is going to be a very expensive process. So, where you know, where are the funds going to come from? Do you think it's a bit of a, a redundant item with the levels of competition we've got now? Well, I think so. Uh, unless you can get an interstate uh, competition up and running where all the states compete, then really, uh, yeah, okay, it, it's just a name we call our state team the Black Swans. They play against Perth Glory in September. Now, um, you, know, you know, the state team's not playing a, a overseas visiting club like it used to in the past. If that was the case and there was two games a year, you know, players had something to aspire to to become a state represent, re- representative. So, uh, you know, I only hope that that's what, um, the, you know, the Football West administration are looking uh, forward to. But, uh, you know, at this stage, I don't think there's anything planned for any games against uh, visiting teams uh, in the near future. Um, And with the Association of Australian Football Clubs, can you see that possibly or can the the associations around Australia who are running soccer at the moment in the different states, is the MPL and the Association of Australian Football Clubs, can they be now putting pressure on those states and when it comes to, you know, you've got the A-League here in Perth, we've got Glory... Is the MPL going to be the next level? Well, John, I think it's going to have a, a virtue will, and will have a say because there are one or two influential people, especially there's a uh, fellow from North Queensland who has very good contacts in FIFA and I don't know if everyone's aware that the FFA, ha, you know, they have to answer the FIFA in regards to a second tier competition and the future of the game here because we're a member of the Asian Football Confederation but we don't have uh, promotion and relegation. And I think, um, you know, promotion and relegation in your leagues is, you know, one of the criteria to be a member of the Asian Football Federation. So FIFA, I think, have given FFA a mandate that they've got to come clean and, uh, you know, give a true indication of, you know, the future of the game here and how it's going to be structured. I mean, I don't really know too much more about the ins and outs, but 
Uh, I know one of the people on our organisation has been in contact with FIFA and there has been letters going backwards and forwards to FFA and to our organisation. So I just only hope that for the sake of the second tier competition that the FFA comes forward with a plan of when are they going to implement change. And that input by FIFA and the AFC, has it given the MPL, the clubs, and now all the clubs who play in the the States in Australia, has that given them a fillip in a sense to to form this association or was that uh, the fillip to to give them that association of Australian football clubs to basically go out and, in a sense, run their their own structures? Well, I think it's given... Because there's so many, my understanding is about 85% of the MPL clubs throughout the country have joined the association. So that obviously is a strong voice, and I would think that that will uh, cause the FFA to react, and also with FIFA on their back as well. You know, we have to have one organisation. We can't have uh, fractured bodies trying to run the game. So if it means that all the bodies can get together to create a vehicle going forward where we're all heading on the same railway track, then, you know, it's a good thing for the game. And uh, you only just hope, you know, I've been around the game for a long time, John, and, uh, you know, it's always been about factions and, you know, uh, people trying to do their own thing. The game needs to have uh, the person at the top directing the traffic, but, you know, making sure that everyone's going over the bridge at the same time. And I don't think that's happening at the moment. John, just explain to our listeners the association of... um football clubs that you're talking about there? Yeah, well, uh, Gary initially went over to a meeting uh, of the Association of Australian Football Clubs, and it's uh, been heartily... Support- NPL, remember, it's NPL. NPL, it's, sorry. It's yeah. NPL Football Clubs. Yeah, NPL Football Clubs. Thanks for, co- for correcting me there, Gary. Um, and uh, it's been heartily supported by a great number, as Gary's just said, 85% of NPL clubs across the country. And the AAFC has already been endorsed by a majority of NPL clubs. Most will be present and were at the first meeting, uh, with many having confirmed they will, uh, they'll come from anywhere to, to, to be at this meeting. Uh, as members of the WAFC, the, the clubs will uh, set its aims and priorities already. However, the overwhelming message from the clubs to the AAFC has been that their priority is to secure formal representation as a special interest group at the forthcoming FFA General Congress. And also, it, it's, uh, you've been given the nod, in a sense, by FIFA. Um, after FIFA and the, the AFC came over here about the lack of transparency in the game here in Australia, which was worrying them. So, really, you've got a pretty strong platform. Can you see any obstacles uh, in confirming, eventually, the Association of Australian Football Clubs? I don't think so, John, because the people that are involved are all uh, passionate about the game and they want to see uh, progress. So, you know, FFA need to understand that, you know, they have to listen to uh, the numbers below them and uh, otherwise, you know, there's going to be continual dissent amongst the ranks. And uh, I'm pretty confident that um, we'll get a fair hearing and uh, there will be change, but hopefully that change is a lot quicker than what um, some people think it may be. And what, um, what's going to happen with the associations we have now, Football West, obviously uh, the organisations who run uh, soccer in the different states or football in the different states, uh, where do they fit in, uh, into, the, into this? Uh, I mean, can, what kind of role are they expected to play when the, when the uh, Australian Association of Australian Football Clubs come together? John, it'll, I think the status quo will remain. It's, we are not going to be a uh, body that's going to be, um, you know, trying to control the game. What we are, we're a representative body of the clubs that are part of the NPL structure, but which is run individually in each state, and hopefully we can get uniformity across the country so that, you know, we have a player point system here, Melbourne, Adelaide, you know, so that we want uniformity across the board. There's a the number of visa players. You know, there's a lot of argument about uh, why is there a restriction on visa players. And, uh, you know, there's one uh, one answer for that. Obviously, visa players cost a lot more money than uh, than uh, local players. And if the income's not there, you know, clubs are not going to survive. So, you know, I've been to Melbourne and Sydney clubs, and uh, most of those clubs, uh, you know, don't have a lot of uh, overseas players in their, you know, teams. And they have younger players that they've got developed through their own system. So... 
you know, we're obviously uh, doing that as well in this state. Uh, some clubs are doing it a little bit more than others, but, you know, it is a financial constraint in trying to improve the level of your game. You know, a lot of people are saying, you know, the lack of visa players has caused the, the standard to drop. You know, maybe some of the clubs haven't developed their juniors the way that they should have, where the standard would be higher. And what about uh, women's now? Of course, uh, women's football is, has gone through the roof over the last decade. Uh, where's their role? Is there going to be a, a women's NPL? And if there is, will they be accepted into the Association of Australian Football Clubs? I think it would, John. Obviously, um, WA is, um, at the moment, I think the numbers are increasing but I don't think they are at the same level as in some of the other states. But uh, from what I understand, Football West will be uh, introducing a women's NPL. Um, I don't know if that'll be 2018 or 2019, but, uh, you know, we're at the club, say so my club, Perth Soccer Club, you know, we've always been a male-orientated club. But, uh, you know, we are making endeavours to become a, uh, you know, dual gender club as well. We you know, we've, we're pushing to try to get uh, female... Uh, yeah, input at our club. We do have one, you know, one junior team. We uh, we are trying to progress that to become a senior club as well. But uh, you know, one thing we are trying to promote the first glory who play at our uh, at our ground, uh, the W League team, and it was great to see them play uh, at Doring Gardens this year, and uh, they had uh, a lot of success under Bobby Deskotowski. I suppose with so, the, with a with a structure like that, though, a new one actually coming in. How does the Association of Australian Football Clubs embrace the rest of football and we're not just talking about senior football we'll go right through the ranks because you're going to be a force in the future if, if, if it gets through so you know uh, is, is the part of the agenda is looking at how you can help and support uh, other levels of our football here in Australia I think so John because eventually I know in New South Wales there's NPL 1, NPL 2 and NPL 3 in Victoria, there's NPL 1, NPL 2. Uh, you know, there's, there's a review happening in WA at the moment. Don't be surprised that if in 2018 or 2019 there'll be an NPL 2 in WA. So obviously, um, you know, the NPL organisation across the board uh, in the country will be trying to expand the competition and, you know, which gives clubs some sort of uh, aim, uh, you know, to achieve and but it has to be done structured properly where clubs are, you know, are going to uh, develop youth players within their club. Because if you don't, if you're look, relying on importing players or you know, getting players on transfer from other clubs, you know, the financial uh, situation will cause that club not to succeed in the long run. I think we might have to finish up. Uh, Gary, we didn't talk about the fixtures at all or the FFA Cup. Do you want to have a He didn't want to talk yeah, about I the know, FFA I'm Cup. Not, I'm not sure yeah. whether... Uh, it's yeah, been, it actually, is it, tr is it true or you were banished to Mandurah? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, we've, we've got a good trip down to Mandurah today. And we've been blessed with some very good weather. So, but You're a shocker, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we get a good result today. Yeah, but isn't that what cup football is about, Gaz? We, we've all been there and done that. Oh, just quickly, you are happy because you've got a ticket for the uh, Champions League Grand Final in Cardiff, your team Juventus, and they're going for their third trophy of the season, Gary. Yeah, I've been very fortunate there, John. My son secured two tickets for the game on the um, in the lottery, and uh, I obviously uh, at short notice I'm off. Tuesday night, and the Juventus are going for the treble. They won the Italian Cup, they won the league last week, and now we're going to beat Real Madrid on uh, Saturday week. Hmm. And, uh, Have you learned to speak I, Welsh? Uh, no, but I, I, I learned to speak <laughs> Italian very quickly, John. <laughs> but, uh, it'll be a fantastic uh, occasion, John, and uh, you know, I know there's some other people from Perth going. And hopefully I'll catch up with them in Cardiff. Well, we might talk to you. We might talk to you live in Cardiff. It's on a Saturday. Um, well, it depends on what it depends on the time difference. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, uh, um, I'll certainly be happy to have a chat to you and let you know what's happening. Because my understanding is there's going to be a full house at the Millennium Stadium, and both teams are in uh, pretty good shape with all their play staff players available. Good one. Gary, thanks for joining us this morning. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Penna. Penny, thank you very much, and thank you, John. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Gary, and uh, enjoy your day down at Mandurah, mate. Yeah, it'll be a long drive. I'm, just, I'm, I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. Five minutes, John. Thank well, you very uh, yeah. much.
Thanks, Cheers, Gary. Mate. See ya. Thanks, Penny. Bye. Bye. Gary Morocchi, president of Perth Soccer Club. You did well there, John. Um, now, we didn't talk about the, the fixtures or, or the FFA Cup at all, but let's just go through that. So, uh, round six last week was... Yeah, it know? was. It was... Um, is my mic on, Pen? Yeah. Oh, okay. It is, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. Um, John, you can be sure your voice is heard. Oh, thanks, Ben. Yeah. Thanks for the compliment. <laughs> um, Bayswater City 6, Gwellop nil. I went to that game and, you know, Gwellop, uh, it's strange really because they, they didn't play bad. They, you know, they, they played they reasonably well and, but, Gwellop Bayswater was such, the yeah, but, yeah, too. but they were such a dominant factor. Bayswater did, they hardly did anything wrong and what they did is they embraced, uh, they embraced Gwellop's game plan put it aside and went with their plan and mm. they won 6-0. Bayswater sitting third on the NPL. On the table, table at the moment, yep. yeah. We'll, go, we'll get to that shortly. Yep. One Roo City nil, Sorrento 2. Uh, Dianella uh, White Eagles 3, Colburn United nil. And Dianella White Eagles actually sitting third in the State League Division 1. Yep. And Western Knights 3, Perth Soccer Club 1, if you're listening on the way down there to Manjur and uh, Gabby. Uh, so, yeah, a few surprises in there. But, uh, again, like we said, uh, Penn, you know, I mean, Cup football, it's, it happens on one day, it's a one-off, and if you play your best football on the day, it doesn't matter what division you're in, then you might come out with a winner. And obviously a couple have. Yeah, absolutely. And so the round seven is on Monday the 5th of June, which is a long weekend, I think. Um, so it'll have to be because uh, games are at 2.30 and 6 o'clock. Yep. And that's Bayswater and Western Knights and Sorrento and Dianella White Eagles. That's round seven of the FFA Cup. Mm-hmm. Um, did you want to go through uh, any matches of the round for the NPL fixtures this weekend, John? Yeah, we, we can have a we can have a look at. Uh, he what, says. what do you think of the uh, matches of the round for this weekend for the NPL? For the NPL, well, yeah. we've got. Do you want to go through them? Uh, go on, far away. Okay, well, we've got um, uh, Dunes of City versus Free. Oh no, hang on, that can't be right. I've got. Uh, Junior Lop City are not in the NPL WA. They're not indeed, Pen. Pen, just bear with me. That's yeah, okay. And I'll just uh, run quickly through the yeah, uh, top eight in the NPL table. Sorry, it's sitting on top with 26 points. And Sorrento, Bayswater, Perth Soccer Club, Junior Lop United, Inglewood, ECU and Coburn. And uh, the long trip down to Mandurah with uh, Perth. I think Perth are playing... Yeah, uh, Perth is a fourth and Mandurah a 14th. So, yes, it's uh, a long trip for... Perth, Mandra sitting on the bottom of the table at the moment, just across on the State League Division 1 table, Rockingham is sitting on top there over South West Phoenix, Dinella White Eagles and UWA Nedlands and on the State League Division 2 table, Gwellup are sitting on top and Wanneroo, then Morley Wind Mills, Kelmscott, Swan United and I think my match of the round for State League Division 2 and we'll talk to um, Dave Kindness about that, it might be uh, Melville City versus Swan or maybe... Molly Windmills versus Quillup. John, how are you going with those fixtures there? We can, yeah. talk, we can talk more later about it if you like. No, that's okay. Yeah, I've, I'll uh, we'll have a look at that again. We have I have got the fixtures for Division Two, uh, Division One, and Division Two. If well, you we'll, want to we'll get through them. No, we no we'll go through those when we have a chat to Dave Kynes because Melville's sitting in State League Division Two, so okay. that'll be relevant to that conversation. It we, will. we might uh, go to a break and come back and have a chat with Greg Farrell, the assistant national coach. For the women's futsal, this is Penn and John in the studio, and and Rose sitting quietly over there, ready to read the women's Premier League fixtures when we have our next guest on. We'll be back very shortly. Gate and Fence Hardware WA are your local business supplying materials, components, and parts for fencing and gates. Practical and simple how-to advice by our family. Products shipped anywhere. Visit our online store at gateandfencehardware.com.au. Station sponsor. Not far from our beautiful Swan River with fields amongst the gum trees east of our Port City Fremantle and a stone's throw from our capital city Perth lies the city of Melville. Supporting a steadily growing population of over 93,000 individuals and creating possibilities for a lot of avid footballers. One of the largest clubs in Western Australia is rising to the challenge that this massive opportunity is presenting. It supports over 800 families, over 1,000 members, 60 teams and 15 different nationalities. That club has developed programs for children that from the age of five nurtured them, mentored them and created pathways to encourage them to give those same qualities back into the community. Melville City Football Club. Find us at melvillecityfc.com.au Football. 
an expression of your sense of community and a celebration of the world game. I want to succeed so badly because we have such a great team and the fans, I think that we owe everyone around us something. Everyone is bought in. I think the togetherness within the squad is huge and it just makes you want to put everything on the field when you know someone's put in a big tackle and you're like, I want to put in a, a tackle like that and I want to play for her and I want to win for this club and this, these fans. This team is special. This team is ruthless. This team is family. This team gives everything for one another. And this team, no matter what, will show you heart and passion every day we get on the field. How would you like that as a promo for your women's football team, Greg? That was Orlando Pride, who is one of the teams in the American National Women's Soccer League over there, of which Tommy Samani, a former Matildas coach, Tom, coaches. Samani's coaching there, isn't he? He is indeed. That, that was a pretty inspiring get up and I want to play soccer, football kind of advert, wasn't get it? Get involved in that, yeah. Mind yeah. you, Orlando, how are you, lad? Greg, John O'Connell. Hello, Greg. Hi, John. How are you? Yeah, good, lad. Um, I was just going to say, Orlando was in Florida, obviously, and, and Miami. And it's been a busy little place over the years with, with that football. Um, you can go back a number of years. I think Rodney Marsh, who played for Queen's Park Rangers and Manchester City, he went down there and, and, and played, and they loved him. It was a bit of a scallywag, mind you, but um, it was entertaining. And Americans like that. They like things that are entertaining. And so um, Florida's not... Um, not too far out when it comes to football, believe me. Well, they seem to attract some pretty decent footballers. There's a, I yeah. mean, there's a handful of Aussies playing in the National Women's Soccer League. Sam Kerr's over there. Lydia Williams is over there. Um, I'm just thinking of. And of course, David Beckham was looking to form his own team in uh, in Miami. I don't know whether that's still on the cards or not. But uh, no, I just thought because uh, it's uh, you know soccer in the states started quite a long time ago. Now we're seeing the benefits of, uh, you know, of the, the input uh, that these kind of people make. Absolutely, we are. Yeah, well, the, the, there's a massive culture, especially more so in America, but I think it's because of the, the internet and, and everything that's happened in the last 20 or 30 years of technology with the world getting so much smaller, people are, are easier, e well, more easily connected. And you look at the, the players who are moving around and playing in different leagues, you only have to look at some of the Australian players who are playing in some of the Premier Leagues in, in Asia and where the, the women's footballers are now playing in Germany and Italy, playing in the US. The, the world's becoming more connected. Yeah. It's it, a, a very big thing for football culture. It, it is, and I guess we've just got to watch out too that um, speaking of W League here, Women's League back here in Australia, that it's all about promoting our own players and providing opportunities for our young players to come through and whatever whatever players at whatever levels we are providing opportunities for them. And we're not just talking young players, we're talking, you know, young, young to me is, well nowadays is 14, 15, 16 when you come in and you start to filter into the national squads, but we're talking yeah. you know, middle-aged players footballers, which would be between the age of 20 and 30, playing at the highest levels, we've got to provide the opportunities at those highest levels here in our country for those players. And it's great to have the likes of Jess Fishlock and um, you know, Nadine Angerer, the, the German national coach, and all these fantastic players coming here to our country and giving us a profile and raising the profile. But we've also got to give profile to our own players, the Sam Kerr's and Lisa Devana's and um, Steph Catley's and, and all those kind of players. That, that's what we've got to have our young players aspiring to and wanting to be a part of, as well as paying money to bring in those other profile players. Yeah, so, well, there was there was a big push. Well, obviously, with the A-League, there's massive hype around any of the imported players. They get the, the marquee contract um, but there was a, a German goalkeeper a few years ago when I was I was living in in Brisbane, who came over. I, I can't think of her name off the top of my head. Nadine Anger, she was number yeah. one player in the world. Nadine, yeah, that's right. She, and, and she had been the the number one goalkeeper in the world for quite a long time. 
and she she came and played for the the raw. She was amazing. I had, I had, a, I had a couple of my schoolgirls were training as a part of the the youth program, and and a friend of mine was also one of the backup goalkeepers for the raw, and they just raved about her. Yeah. And the the impact that she had on those young players was terrific. But as you say, it has to be balanced with providing opportunities for Australian players as well. And if if you look at something like the English Premier League, they've the, the percentage of English players has dropped incredibly in the last 10 or 15 years. Are you and talking about the men's EPL or the women's soccer league? I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm talking about the men's EPL at yep. the moment, but the, the idea is the same. If we've watered down the, the amount of Australian players that get opportunity, it, it'll have the same impact where our league won't be as good because eventually those players leave. Um, and you, the opportunity you could have given to a young Australian player has been missed. Yes, I think I think also, um, Greg. The thing is, is that all those women in wherever in Europe, South America, North America, and Canada, even Canada, um, you know, they they all come from a football culture background, yeah, which is not being strong here in Australia. And so when our girls go over and get to play in the top teams in Europe, in America, and what have you, that is pretty awesome. All we need is the media, our media here in Australia, to tell us about it, mm. to support it, yeah, and, and give them the credit. Yeah. You know, because well, they're flying yeah. the flag. Mm. Yeah, certainly. It was it was something you guys were talking about a little bit earlier where you were discussing what needs to be done with, with Australian football. And Penny, you said, is it at a point where we should just go out and do it ourselves? And I think, unfortunately, in Australian football, there is a little bit of a, a mentality where possibly at the higher levels, we sort of expect things to happen. Yes. Um, and, and obviously there's, there's grassroots, there's, there's always volunteers and people who are out working their butts off every weekend, every night during the week. But at the higher levels with, with FFA, with the amount of the, the, the figures you talked about coming into the NPL and WA, it, it seems like there's an expectation that it'll get done somewhere along the line, but not necessarily by me right now. Yes. Yeah, I think the thing about that, Greg, though, is that the people who are coming in at the top don't want to put the hard yards in, and they look down at the people down below who are the boots to provide them with that. Well, I don't know about that, actually. The, the model has got to change, and I'm not sure how, how it can change, but we've got this massive monster of a game that just keeps on growing, and we're talking numbers grow, participation grow, so resources are going to be required. Money is going into the sport. Um, and, but we have all these opportunities to represent. We've got youth, uh, SAP, NTC, state team representation, W League, uh, Socceroos, um, you know, national teams at Joey's and youth. And what, I mean, that's a lot of money going up to the top end and also out of Australia to compete internationally. So it's a lot of money required. So how do we change that model? Man, this conversation could go on forever, of course, but how do we change that model so that it filters back down? and encourages our players and coaches and all the resources here to be the best that it possibly can be. But um, you don't have to answer that because, you know, we don't have the answer, I don't think, and we should keep talking <laughs> for the next half an hour about it. <laughs> well, the, the only thing I, w I would add to that is if, if you look at what the AFL has done, and unfortunately with my Beckenham hat on, I've, ju I've just lost another player this week to AFL. Oh, dear. Um, there's, there's been a, a very big drain, and... There is no reason why there is that there shouldn't be a massive group of players coming from other sports to football if the FFA, if football were, were putting in the hard yards that the AFL have been putting in. Well, I mean, they've had to, haven't they? When we come out with stats like we are the biggest participation sport and um, Audi Mini Roos uh, get sponsored and put all over national TV, then you know, someone else has to lift their game if they want to you know, chunk of that mark, market. Now, Greg... We've got to do some talk about the IFA Women's World Cup in yeah. the futsal, all right? So tell us, firstly, what is IFA? Tell our listeners what it's about and how it fits into the football landscape. Yeah, so the, the IFA is the, the International Football Alliance. It was set up, um, I guess, to fill a little bit of a gap in between what FIFA offers and there, there is another world governing body, AMF. Um, they've sort of had their... That, they, that was the original Futsal World Governing Body, but 
they've dropped off in participation quite a lot. But also with, with FIFA, um, FIFA don't offer things like a a Women's World Cup. They don't offer very strong youth and especially female futsal participation programs. And even even through the FFA and Football West, there's not a I suppose a driving force with promoting futsal in Australia. So the the IFA was set up to to fill those holes, provide players with opportunities. Um, there's there was the under 17 men's World Cup last year, the women's this year. There's also an under 14 competition in South America. I think it's in Brazil towards I think it's October or November. And I've been told there's going to be between 16 and 24 countries competing in that, with obviously Brazil and Argentina and the like putting so, sides into it. So, Greg, just to confirm then, you, you mentioned uh, FIFA, but futsal. Now, uh, futsal is endorsed by FIFA, but like you said, the futsal stream isn't particularly well advertised or well supported in terms of the number of levels and competitions and things like that through FIFA. No. So, the IFA, is that all different forms and associations of the game outside of FIFA, or is it... Um... No, it, it's specifically for futsal. Okay. So it, it, it's not mini football and, and six aside and all that sort of thing. It, it's just for futsal. There's, so there's the, the United States Futsal Federation, um, obviously the Australian Futsal Association, who, who we were in Spain representing last week, um, and then there's bodies from France and the UK, um, Italy, Spain, fr- from everywhere, basically. And are um, they all endorsed by their local national association, like your team that went away, or the Australian team that went away, is endorsed by FFA because they're a member of uh, FIFA? No, so, so that's a, some of them are. Quite a few of the um, quite a few of the countries are endorsed by their national football association. But some have been set up, set up as a futsal association because of that gap. Okay, that is fantastic. So this is basically bringing together any women's football program in futsal that wants to be a part of a national competition. I think it's that's fantastic. Everyone wanting to communicate and network and get that together. Great. Well, and and, and it's not not only for women. It's it, it's certainly also for for men's futsal. Um, like I said, it, it's a a body that's been set up by and, and for organisations to give players opportunities. Um, so there's, as I said, from under 14 all the way up to, to the men and the women, competitions for various bodies to enter depending on, on their well, their, their membership with IFA. And what's the organisation like, Greg? You, you're mentioning about each country, country has a different setup and structures and things like that, but uh, is, it, is it all together? I mean, uh, you've, you've got FIFA, who obviously uh, is, the, is the governing body of football in the world. Um, yeah. Is there a world um, futsal uh, organi- set-up structure organisation? Um, uh, or is that the IFA? Well, un- unfortunately... You know what I mean? I'm just thinking like that, you know, if yeah. something like that's got to come together really yeah. tight, you know, so... Well, the, the, so FIFA, FIFA run the, the Men's Football World Cup, uh-huh. and then they, through their member, through, through CONCACAF and um, the Asian Football Federation, they run uh, international men's competitions as well, yeah. but... That that's all. That that's the limit of what there is through FIFA for futsal. So where's the women uh, missing out? Yeah, that's it. They are so, missing out. That's where they're well, yeah, yeah, they, in. they are. And, and and also the the younger younger age groups, the youth women, the youth men, um, and then that's where the the IFA have, a, as you said, stepped in and and tried to fill that gap. So you you do get players and teams that play in the FIFA futsal side, but because there isn't an option to represent at the level that they're at at the point at that point in time, they're, they're now coming to IFA. So how, how does that change then, Greg? Because, like I said, is in, if you want to start international football at any age group, it could be under 10s. It's going to be a lot more healthier if they're all under the one body you would like rather to, than... You'd like to think after the success or, or you know, growing numbers or whatever the IFA kind of 
gather as a, the momentum of the competition grows over time that FIFA would go, huh, we should really take this under our wing yes. because there'll be opportunities, there'll be more women coming into the game, you know, we can give it TV rights, all that kind of stuff. But there'll be a lot well, more transparency as, as well. Mm. Well, yeah, uh, uh, unfortunately, with with anything, there there is always that uh, desire to hold power, and I think it, it's with, called exploitation, Greg. <laughs> yeah, well, un unfortunately, with, with everything that we have seen with FIFA and with with football, you you sort of are, are worried that the the best interests aren't always being looked after, and that, that you don't have to go any further than. To, to just list what is available to players. There, there's nothing for women's football players. There's nothing for junior football players. So it, it's not necessarily being made a priority. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that the, the longer that the, the FIFA uh, ignore it, then the more traction and foothold and growth that the IFA and those other associations that want to do something and are doing something will have. So they'll become this monster eventually with the women's football and the other whatever's doing whatever they're doing and then you have a parallel organisation that kind of irks me a little bit because like John said that FIFA are supposed to be the organisation getting all of this happening and yet in their absence it's like the um, like the association of football you were talking about and NPL clubs they're doing it because they feel that there has to be something happening to represent them so the IFA is, is representing them because in the absence of the World Organisation not doing it. Well, I, th I think it. with the Association of Australian Football Clubs is that what they're, they're saying is they're not being listened to. Yeah. And, and they're, they're becoming an organisation like 3,000 players now playing MPL. Um, so they need guidance, they need direction, but if it's not coming from outside or from the people that should be giving them that guidance, then they're taking it upon themselves to form their own association. Now, don't you get distracted with men's football because we're talking... No, I'm not, but, I, no, but I'm making a point with the with, same with women's football. Sometimes, you know, you get these mavericks who, who set up an association yes. here or association there, but they never come together. But if they're genuinely doing it for the right reasons, like the it, IFA... They'd be is, under one roof. It's, it's like, everyone, come yeah, in, there's, there's the a hole. Roof. Let's fill that hole. I think that's fantastic. Greg, um, well, let's brag about the number yeah. of West Australians that were in that Australian team. And by the way... Congratulations for for your selection and position as the assistant national coach of the Australian team. Who won silver? Well done. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It it was terrific to so the the process went from the the national championship in January. I, I coached the the West Coast women's futsal team, and then for the the national we had, we had a trial camp in Sydney, and we had a secondary camp um, probably about eight weeks ago. And then we had another five day long camp before we flew to Spain. Um, and, and during that process, we had 25 players from Queensland, northern New South Wales, central coast, north New South Wales, Sydney, Melbourne, country Victoria, and obviously the WA girls. And from that, we had Andrea Prieto, Lindsay Jobling, Chelsea Winchcombe, and Jess Lindquist chosen. Um, and uh, obviously, I, I was a part of the selection process. But a, a big Gee, that's a bit dodgy, Greg. <laughs> well, hey, that's a, a bit a, dodgy, a big, son. Yeah, well, a, a big thing for me, and uh, I'm a school school teacher by trade, so it's always been to make sure that there is transparency. And a big part of it for me was not to p push the players that I've coached before, and to certainly look at everybody with with a, I guess, not the rose into glasses. Who was um, the coach, by the way, Greg? So the, the coach is Jodie Hammond. She's a uh, an Austra or ex Australian football player uh, from Brisbane. So okay. she's she's played at, at several several women's World Cups with um, uh, AMF football, and I think she actually played. There, there was a women not World Cup quite a long time ago through FIFA, and I'm, I'm pretty sure she played in that. So yeah, in the name of progress, Greg, where to from now? Sorry, what was that? In the, in the name of progress, where do you go to from now? Well, we need to look at, at making sure football at the grassroots level is growing. And acro across the country it is. Unfortunately, as I said, that there's not much coming from FFA or Football West in that. So West Coast Futsal is not affiliated to 
um, Football West. Have you yeah, met Have you met with them, Greg, and spoken to them about uh, this situation? Oh, certainly. They were unfortunately, as I said, there's there is a little bit of a rivalry that builds because Football West run futsal for several months in the year, um, and when they go to send players and teams to the national championships, they've got to find players. Um, now we've got players who train regularly every week for futsal with junior players. And because they also play outdoor football, those players then get approached to play futsal for other organisations. And would there ever be a chance that you and them could come together for, well, the, 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 for the sake of the game? It, well, it, it was one body a long time ago, and I wasn't involved when there was a split. I, I don't know too much of the politics about it. Um, I, I try to stay away from the, the high-level politics, if I can possibly... Um, but it, it would be terrific. It would be the, the best scenario to have every futsal player playing in the one competition under the one body. But for that to happen, you have to look at Football West, FFA, and and their set up their organisation. So are you are you off, are, 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 are you offering an olive branch? <laughs> Sorry, are you offering an olive branch? Oh, the, as as I said, it, it would be perfect. Unfortunately. There are powers much higher than me that I don't think want it to happen. Well, it's not happening now, so what's going to change? Well, uh, can I just comment on that? We've, you can. We've had um, the boys from the Futsal Centre in WA and the Australian Mini Fo Football Association, and their competitions are growing. Like, we're talking thousands. I reckon between West Coast Football and Mini Football. Because there's there's a gap there. There's a gap that's re required. People want to play this form of football. And it might just be a social form of football, but it's a form of football that eventually creates enough uh, popularity that they want to provide opportunities for growth, like representative teams and higher levels of football. And I mean, there's probably I don't know, ten to fifteen thousand players in this form of football that's not run by our uh, FFA and Football West. That's a yeah. hell of a lot of lobbying, and you know. You know, Football West and school sports have just got their collaboration happening after how many decades? Um, so I'd like to say that it won't, you know, be decades before all of the forms of football get together, Greg. But in the absence of of someone organising it, you've done what anyone would do. It is just fill the hole, and then what well, happens in the end? Is people have to get together again. That getting together bit is really hard. Yeah, well, and as, as you said, it is growing. We've got. Um 45 junior teams that play every Saturday at, at Karanup and that, that's grown in the last two years from about 10 teams. We have we have 50 and just above 50 kids training once a week specifically for futsal. Now none of that is offered through the other, the governing body. Yeah well isn't that though, a really good reason um, for everybody to come together and realise you know if we keep working apart then obviously there's going to be confusion. But then if we can come yeah, together... And everything is diluted, yeah. Yeah, if we can bring it all together and have respect for one another, but then whether again, it be John, football west or... With, with respect, those things take time. And if the hole is there and someone fills the hole and then you organise your structures and your resources and your opportunities and you go along your way and you keep replicating that like Greg and, and the futsal teams and the uh, higher level competitions and they go away and they get representation, they get promotion, they get publication, they get on YouTube, they get these IFA uh, associations and networks happening. There's all of that that has developed along the way. Then, yeah. then you've got to get someone from at, at whatever level to talk to the what they say is the main football body for that country or or, or world and, talk, and, and that's that's a whole lot of talking collaboration that is required after all of these two pathways are developed you know, it does my head in thinking about what happens in the meantime yeah but i think if we've all got everything in common then i know. this shouldn't be a major problem yeah and, 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 as you say john if this if the best interests are at yes. heart for everybody, yes. then uh, at, at some point in time that will happen. Yes. My my phone number isn't a secret. Um, it's it's quite easily accessible on the West Coast Football website, and people at Football West, people with, with the FFA, know about the Australian Football Association. They know about the International Football Alliance. It, it's not a secret. Um, there there certainly will be too many benefits of coming together 
for it to be ignored. But at, at this stage, it, it can't just be the people who, as Penny just said, have done all that groundwork, holding out their hand, saying we would like to, to organise something without it being reciprocated, without there being a come from the other side. Well, he seems to be an honest bloke, Greg, and I know some of the blokes down there at Football West, and I would think that they, they would have common sense in mind. Uh, you know, it amazes me that the amount of people I get to sit down and talk to who think certain things are great ideas, but nobody really takes up the challenge of bringing it together. And, and if it's for the benefit of our game, which is football, then why not make it happen? Yeah, I, as I said, I, I would love the, the football in Australia to be played under one body to be united. Um, but it, it is just about those steps actually happening. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I, I'm actually going to have to get going. So I'm, I'm supposed to be starting coaching at 11. Have you got your boots on? <laughs> Uh, I've got my football boots on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is where you've got to buy this week. Was that planned? Did you have a word to Football West after coming back from your trip you had to have a buy? <laughs> no, unfortunately I, w I would have liked to have had a buy a couple of weeks ago when we played the NCC and we were missing Andy and Jess from our, our starting side. Yep. That, yep. That, would have been, that would have been handy to have a buy then. Well, um, good luck with your coaching. Well done with all your opportunities and everything that you're doing for futsal and we'll chat again, Greg. Thank you very much, Penny and John, for having me on it. Yeah, good on you, Greg. Take care. See you, Greg. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. That was uh, Greg Farrell, who was the assistant national coach at the IFA Women's World Cup. Why are we always dealing with problems in our game? <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> the, the biggest sport about? in the world, as we've said. But, you know, we have a, a problem not uh, knowing... The, the problem isn't it's, it's the biggest game in the world. It's... The problem is, is the people who are running the game and are taking in it are making it difficult for it to happen. Well, now, um, Rose is uh, really wanting to read out some fixtures. So we will, we will say that uh, Greg was is also the Beckenham Women's Premier League coach and we'll go through some of the information, fixtures and results and tables, etc. for the women's competition now. And uh, we'll start off with the Women's Premier League, Rose. Here we go. So we're going to talk about the Women's Premier League the table and the fixtures for this week. Rose, go for it. Yeah, okay. So, NTC is um, playing Bassendine. East Rio is playing North Red Ducks. Red Backs? Red Backs, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Queen's Park is versus Calcutta. And Beckenham has a bye. They do. And how's the table looking? So, um, top of the table is Queen's Park. Close second is NTC. Um, third, Balcatta. Fourth is East Rio. Fifth, Northern Red Backs. Six Bassendine, and last on the ladder is Beckenham. Good, clear voice. Well done. And last week's results were NTC defeated East Fremantle 5 1, Bassendine lost to Balcatta 5 2. Uh, Beckenham and Northern Redbacks game was postponed. I suspect that was because uh, Greg and some of the players were away, and Queen's Park had the bye. I know Queen's Park are looking for a, um, a coach at the moment, a reserves coach. Um, they're growing yeah, rather already, rather yeah. rapidly. Uh, well done there at Queen's Park. They've got a very strong squad this year and, of course, the, the Woodfin family are, are doing their bit as usual down at the club. Um, just moving over to the Women's uh, State League Division 1. Sitting on top of the table there is Wanneroo and then UWA Nedlands and then Sterling Panthers, Leeming, Bunbury, Subiaco and Curtin. And I reckon the match of the round this weekend in the State League Division 1 would probably be Wanneroo versus Sterling Panthers. All women's games are on Sunday. And it is a cup round this weekend. So for the Metro women's competitions, there's cup fixtures uh, right across just about uh, everywhere you can think of in uh, well, Perth, not WA. I don't think there's any... And that's where every man and his dog, or every woman and their dogs, get a get a look in, isn't it? I'm actually, I'm actually just thinking: is there any country teams in the cup in this round? And I I don't know. I'm just having a quick look through all of the fixtures. There's uh, Mandra City, Port Kennedy, Joondalup, um, Carama, but I cannot see a Bunbury or a Denmark. There was a Denmark team in there last year. In fact, they beat Melville. I was unhappy with that, but they did very well and. Got up into the higher rounds there. And uh, I did want to speak to Greg about this, but we'll get him back and have a chat at some point. There's going to be a change in the women's development team or the women's resources at Football West. And my comment on that is that over the past 
few years, and especially this year, women's competition has been, there's been so many changes. It's just been awful, really. I hope that there will be good things come of all these reviews and surveys and revisions that uh, James Curtis, sitting on the top of the Football West tree as CEO, is going to see and change. Uh, but the allocation of resources to women's football has been it has been pretty woeful. Uh, let's face it, it's it's supposedly the fastest growing part of our game. Now, I don't know which part of the game and at what point we're going to say, well, you know what, if it's growing that fast, we need to de- dedicate this amount of resources to it because it's not. it doesn't appear to be happening. If you look at the women's competition and how it's changed over the past couple of years, landing in, in what's happened this year, it's pretty much a reflection of how we've organised our sport, how we've allocated resources to our sport over the nth number of years. Now, I think that's not great and that needs to change. Well, I think the thing about that as well, Penny, is, is that, and it's the same with men's football and has been over the years, are we, are we reaching out too quickly? You know, we, we love the idea of, of women being involved in our football. Now, like, no, like, like the, are you, hang on a second. Are, no, are you kidding me? No. No, no, no. no the girl, but can but, I, can but I, you said too quickly. Oh, no, I what I'm saying that. is, is that you put the ideas on the table for women's football, NPL leagues, same with the men or what have you, like the A-League. Now, I thought, somebody asked me about, you know, where's the, A- where's the A-League at the moment? Or is, what, is there room for uh, another league? The thing is, is when you set up, or the FFA sets up the A-League as the biggest league in the country, they should have also been thinking about uh, promotion and relegation. And the idea of having a second league at the same time as having an A-League. So when the A-League's all set and, look, and structured... Look, I disagree. I, I'm a big one for organic growth. You can't sit down a structure... If yeah, you but you look know, at the A-League, but, but you it's, don't not, know. it's not... The A-League is not really... You do not know what the future's going to hold. If you don't know what the future's going to hold, you let the growth grow organically. And yeah, organically... But, may, but, it but may, you look at the Women's Premier League, Penny. How many teams John, has come... How, how, how the many biggest teams, part of our game is yes, girls' growth. Yes. Under the age of 15, okay? It's... Boys and girls football, rubble, mini football, it's just growing. Yeah, and it's because is. kids want to it play. Is. It Those is. kids become adults. And as they become adults and keep playing, this is the, the retention part, very important. As they keep playing, we need to look at what resources well, what they suppo- need. What support it? Hang on exactly. a second here. So the resources then need to be diverted to those parts. And where do you get if, the resources from? If the players... Don't play. Where did you get the resources from? I, I don't care. That's not the point right at this moment. The point is that if the players keep playing, they need resources. They need things to be structured. Okay, so they need to get done then. Where does it come from, the resources? Tell me where the resources should come from. The resources can come from... Okay, let's say there's um, let's say there's 50, 50% of girls playing soccer at mini Roos level right. and 50% of boys. Let's say it's not quite that even, okay, but so why wouldn't you give 50% of the resources from the fees and 50% of the resources from the fees of boys and girls equally to develop them as they reach that next level? Well, if that's the right idea, why aren't they doing it? I don't know. Okay. I'm just saying it's woeful that it's not being done in a very proportionate or yeah. or consistent way. Look, I, it's, I, I'm it, not it's looking showing, at, yeah, I'm not looking the about the progress of the, pro- the the amount of women and girls and and young boys and all that playing, but you know we're struggling to find resources to maintain the surge. We are not struggling to find resources. Well, well where is it? It's out there. It's just not being done. Well, I, can you see it anywhere? I mean, can you advise Football West, for instance, well, look, if you want resources to do this and that, why don't you go to there? It's not my job to sort that out. No, I know that. Uh, if I we've got that. the biggest participation sport, okay, if we've got the biggest participation sport, that, that means there's money there. Kids who want to, they want to play, they're paying a fee to play. But that's getting the problem, a there isn't any them. money there. What do you mean? Well, there's no money to put us in the same position. I mean, we've got more people playing than the AFL, the Rugby League. But you're talking, their support is billions of dollars. I'm not talking on a higher level. This can be just at a no, grassroots yeah, level. No, but it flows down, Penn. It flows down. The money that the AFL get, you know, um, from governments, from state governments, that's from federal pro- government. But that's the problem. It gets it, channeled down to the juniors. But it shouldn't have to flow down. It should come from the bottom up. As the organic growth, uh, the numbers and the, and the girls and the boys increase... Allocate resources along the way, not you know, wait till it gets Penny, to pop and it's no, the big in, kitty in, and then yeah, it's but hang down on. again. In all honesty, the people who are supporting the game in in Australia at the moment are the are the football families. 
the mums Absolute, and dads. Absolutely. And they're not really being supported. They still have to fork out. In the following season, it's more. The following season after that, it's more. So when does somebody say, well, hang on a second, we've got to... I don't dispute that. And we, John, we need to be supporting honestly, this. Honestly, John, a lot of that is not going to change. At the grassroots level, that's not going to change. And a lot of the things, I'm not quite sure they should change because parents go and support their kids and put whatever their time is and resources are, that's their, their own time, two legs on the pitch to help do this and that and whatever, and they will always do it. Yeah, that but won't per, change. parents shouldn't have to pay through the nose because the, well, the associations okay, and the well, bodies who are running the game are not supporting that's them. That's different. Okay, we've got a couple of messages in here from Paul, who's a, an avid Socceroo supporter. Can the Socceroos win the World Cup in 2018 if there is 1%? chance then we'll show 99% of faith go Aussies and I still haven't seen the ladder of the NPL advertised in the sports section of our West Australian newspaper how hard can it be Football West need to do something about this well did, we, we went through the table didn't we just for Paul if he's listening in we did okay now we are going to move across to our next guest John now we've um, got the adrenaline going in that robust discussion got the steam out we're going to go to a break and we're going to come back and chat to Dave Connors from Melbourne City FC. Back shortly. The team behind footballwa.net can boast the best independent local football website and football forums in WA. These are sites devoted entirely to promoting the local game and our history. Visit footballwa.net for the World Football Program guest lineup every Friday. Radio Fremantle. Recognising volunteers who support football in the local community. Not far from our beautiful Swan River with fields amongst the gum trees east of our port city Fremantle and a stone's throw from our capital city Perth lies the city of Melville. Supporting a steadily growing population of over 93,000 individuals and creating possibilities for a lot of avid footballers. One of the largest clubs in Western Australia is rising to the challenge that this massive opportunity is presenting. It supports over 800 families, over 1,000 members, 60 teams and 15 different nationalities. That club has developed programs for children that from the age of five nurtured them, mentored them and created pathways to encourage them to give those same qualities back into the community. Melville City Football Club. Find us at melvillecityfc.com.au Football, an expression of your sense of community and a celebration of the world game. Gate and Fence Hardware WA are your local business supplying materials, components and parts for fencing and gates. Practical and simple how-to advice by our family. Products shipped anywhere. Visit our online store at gateandfencehardware.com.au. Station sponsor. Oswest Fencing and Wrought Iron. Our family fabricates fence panels, gates and framework. Repairs gates and sets up automated systems. Ring us on 9258 6822 for old-fashioned family service and advice. Station sponsor. Welcome back to the World Football Program. We've got Dave Kindness, the president of Melville City Football Club, on the line. Good morning, Dave. Hey, good morning, Penny and John. Yes, good morning, David. And just getting off my knees, actually, when she mentioned you were president, <laughs> I dropped onto yeah. my knees straight away, David. Yeah. It wasn't because of our robust discussion. You were <laughs> cut off, were you, John? <laughs> yeah, robust discussion indeed. It's excellent. Yeah. You, yeah. You, Point. As, as long as we fix the solutions, David, that's the main as thing. As long as we can have a cup of tea and, and, and calm down yeah, afterwards, it's yeah. all good. I mean, it's yeah. a bit of a contentious thing uh, and has been for uh, a long while now, but I, I think it's, it's really time to change. I mean, we, we've got to stop uh, treating our sport here in Australia like second-rate citizens uh, because they're not. They're hard-working people. They do what everybody else does. They pay their taxes. But, you know, when it comes to distribution of money within the sporting communities here in Australia, we're certainly lagging behind everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Dave, a good example for me is, and you can certainly um, you know, throw your weight into this one, but um, some of the facilities that are getting built or upgraded around the, the sporting environment, um, Bunbury have got their, uh, the South West Phoenix have got their new facility down there, uh, Forest Field have got their grounds uh, upgraded. Um, uh, Mills Park have got that wonderful complex they're playing on, and um, and the council and government have put money in for that. I don't think the clubs had to put anything into that. Um, 
Uh, what's happening at Murdoch? Give us a, a, a bird's eye view of what's happening there and the progress on things there. Okay, the progress is uh, moving on really well. In fact, uh, all the you know the civils have done that. The hardcore uh, that uh, carries everything and the membranes in for drainage and it's it's quite a complex situation, but it's really moving on pretty well. I'm led to believe that turf will be laid in a couple of weeks' time, two to three weeks' time. Um, and once that's done, you know, it's, gee, it's, we're only, you know, just coming into June, so maybe by the end, mid to the end of July, we could be actually uh, doing something on it. It would be absolutely fantastic if we could. But that, the facilities around it, like the stadium and things like that, they still will take a little bit of time to get built? Yes, that's correct, yeah. Uh, I mean, State League wouldn't be playing up there this season, I don't think. I don't think. We might manage one game or something, but... Um, no, it's fantastic. We've got a lot of development been going on. And really, you know, the thing about it, and, and you guys are quite correct, sometimes it's from the bottom up. You know, here's Forestville. They, they did all that work themselves. The committee worked hard to get where they are, and the council came came and helped them out, which is absolutely brilliant, you know. And the same down in the city of Gosnells, they've helped out a lot as well. And I believe it's probably the same thing happening up north as well. So it's it's fantastic. And where, where David, uh, you've obviously, you know, gone through your committees uh, de developing this structure, and where did the help and support come from outside of your own club? Um, well, it, it, I guess the, the initial push is into the council itself and trying to convince them. You know, we've, we've been pushing this thing for four, four years, maybe even more. And uh, we start talking to the council and they start to listen eventually and and um, then things start to happen and you find out a bit more. You know, we were lucky to get Mavic University involved and they've been fantastic. But there's a bit of bureaucracy that's got to be dealt with up there as well. But look, it's m more playing services. And yes, we we should be working uh, harder with the younger kids because that's where the, the future is going to come from. And what will, what will Murdoch benefit from this in the sense you, you're going to be piling lots of kids, young kids and things like that onto the, into the, um, the, the uh, uh, compl complex. Um, so where, where do they come into the, the bigger picture as a benefit of having Melville there? Well, uh, their main aim is to, to get involved with the community and they can do that through, um, um, you know, Melville City FC. Uh, but also they can, Gain by uh, having students, kids who play on the university. Oh, I'm going to go to Murray University because they do this, that, and the other, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have also a, a benefit coming in the future, hopefully, that we can get uh, scholarships, uh, frugal scholarships up there, but also and get the use of their medical, uh, their sports science, um, I guess, the students and the facility, the labs where we can put some of the old crops off there to get checked out and see how the knees are doing or whatever. You know. Actually, I was just thinking, I was just thinking, David, that, you know, you're in a great position, really, because there's so many things that you can, uh, you can work uh, glove in hand with the university itself. And as you said, science, medicine, things like that. And yeah. Obviously, the welfare of young children who are participating in sport. I mean, yeah. it's virtually hands-on for Murdoch University and yourselves, isn't it? Is it a similar yeah, situation is. to the ECU set up, do you think, Dave? Uh, no. Well, ECU don't really come out to the community. They just have their, their junior NPL teams from 11 right through to 16, then the the 18s. Uh, 21s and uh, 18s, 20s, first team. We, we're taking like 1,500 kids, men, women, everything into into the modern university scenario. So I would say we're doing a lot more community-wise, or they, uh, the university, are doing a lot more community-wise to uh, to. I guess it, 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 I guess it's a business proposition for them as well. You know, they're looking at getting students from the local areas who may may have gone to Curtin or may have gone somewhere else, you know. I think one, of, of, course, the, one of the big attractions for Murdoch is, uh, yeah, for Murdoch is the profile of Melville City obviously being the largest club in the area, or probably yeah. south of the river. I don't know if it's, is it still the largest club in West Australia, Dave? Um, I think maybe well, Quinns, Quinns or Eastman have always been pretty close. 
Oh no, uh, Quinns are way behind us. They're only about nine hundred. The, the, the biggest one would be UWA, I think. Ah yes. Oh yeah. yeah. In fact, I think because of the mini rouge program, I think they might be up around eighteen hundred. Yeah, they could be. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So my thought is, with the profile of the club, um, it really does, you know, kind of it. It's enticing for Murdoch, and there's a lot of represent representations from Melville, like. Um, the young ones possibly going to like the Singer Cups in Singapore and um, getting into the NTC program, state program, the NPL. I mean, all of those uh, high-profile things that you can imagine a high-profile university or a university that wants to get a higher profile can affiliate with the most popular participated sport in the country. Absolutely. Yeah, there's no question about that. You know, if, I'm sure they will encourage us to enter tournaments abroad up in, up in Asia and even over east yep. to try and uh, advertise their uh, university, you know? Absolutely, yeah, and yeah. Uh, look, having a facility at Murdoch with an artificial surface, a nice stadium and the sports science facilities, etc., and maybe even accommodation at some point, it means yeah. that teams can travel to the Melville Murdoch ground. Just for our listeners, when does the, the Melville part finish and the, uh, the joint venture or new name, when does that start? Okay, um, we, we've actually uh, started to set up a committee just now on having a, a sort of open day or an open day event uh, from our side. Now, we'll probably do something with it. The council will probably get involved and obviously not at university as well. Um, we've got a meeting there on Tuesday, so all that's on the agenda. And, you know, we'll have a bit more information uh, for you on that one, you know. Yeah, I can see I can see a lot of pluses there, David. In in the sense that, you know, um, you can come to football can come together with the university, and God only knows what kind of programs you can set up, which will be of benefit to to both identities. And um, as you mentioned, yeah. uh, maybe you know you you can um, play some game, bring teams in from from outside of Western Australia to be part of that as well. And training, Perth Glory training. Yeah. And, and I can see you at, at the end of your presidency, you'll offer your body to science <laughs> at, the, at the university, David, so they can look through all the, the knocks and, the, and 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 you know the all your knees and what have you. So yeah. I, I, I'm I'm I've got to congratulate you on that, you shrewd man. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, the club itself now, I mean, obviously with that kind of news and that kind of progress, uh, is um, everybody's got a, uh, an extra step in, in, in when, they, when they go down there? Well, look, it, it does make a difference, John. Um, uh, we had a um, volunteers function up there on uh, a week past Friday, and uh, it had to be arranged fairly quickly, but there were 60, 70 people there. It was excellent, you know? Yep. And mm -hmm. uh, we feed them and give them some soft drinks, you know? We don't drink a lot of alcohol up there, but um, it's all very... Uh, everybody was excited about the place, you know, the, the, the surroundings. And we, even though it was still dark, we were showing people, oh, well, the, the synthetic pictures are across there. You can sort of see it. Yeah. Something in the, in the moonlight, you know? But, you know... It, Ah, oh, you're romancing a bit there, David, the moonlight. And the, uh, look, it, it's, what Dave's saying is it's actually it's really important to provide as many opportunities as possible to the club members to know that this is what's happening to the club so they can be familiar, be comfortable with it, know what's happening, um, you know, not have to wonder or be confused um, because at the moment, I mean, the club is playing across uh, Len, Len Shearer, Winthrop and Murdoch. Are they the three? And Marmion, maybe, as well. Yeah, well so we, we train at Marmion, but the, the other three you mentioned, we're playing games on a Sunday there as well. And mm. that's and that's John cool. Connell, I think, as well. John Connell, exactly. Yeah, uh, we're, we're 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 there today against Swan United. So yep. And yeah. Uh, so so in knowing this, that the club has grown to a point where it's got all these different parts to it, is really important to say, well, okay, we're moving into Murdoch. The facility is happening. You need to get as much awareness to the members and the community as possible and if you want to stamp it with a particular kind of branding like that's going to be where the NPL team is going to play or that's where the women's teams are going to play or that's where you know, a stream of the junior part of the club is going to play then, then the club and the community need to know before it happens that this is going to happen. Yeah. And we were having a great old debate about resources earlier. 
Mm. And and I'm just thinking I'm I'm just yeah, I'm just thinking now is that that's resources. Yeah, it is. You you've been given resources by the university. Yeah. And, and I know uh, the other thing is uh, maybe down the track I don't know David but is there a, a, a financial uh, s- structure to that as well maybe maybe the, the, the university itself might come forward on certain projects uh, in conjunction with yourselves and uh, being able to finance the clubs at time well the, look that would be absolutely fantastic however uh, they feel that at, at this stage they've put a lot of money into this project mm-hmm and, uh, you know, anything that we want to add to the situation, we would most likely have to, have to finance it ourselves. However, um, they, they would look at assisting us in the overseas travel scenario where we can advertise their university and tournaments abroad, you know. So, yeah, down the track, there, there is quite a bit. I think we've got to just get up there, get settled in, get to know the people, get to know how it all works and, uh, you know, try and improve our game, improve the, the, the standard of soccer in, in WA. Yeah. That's, a, that's the important bit. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I see that. You know, we were talking about resources, where they come from, and when is, when is it going to happen. But that's a resource for you that you've, you've obviously, um, you know, accepted with both hands. And, and that, that kind of problem that you have now as a committee is starting to dissipate a little bit more. And, oh, absolutely, you know, yeah. And there's more confidence in, in what you can now achieve, as we were talking yeah. earlier. And the more you talk about it and the more yeah. the community members know about it, the, the more yeah. help you But it's got to happen, things. hasn't it? And it's happened for Melville. Yeah. yeah. It's happened yeah. for Melville. So, um, Dave, before we let you go, I did want to uh, just mention that the collaboration between school sports and Football West is a, is a very good one. It just happened this week. And... Peter Ricker's smiling face uh, on the Football West website today, uh, sorry, this week, alongside James uh, Curtis, the Football West CEO, was a good one. Um, you know, the golden handshake has been many years coming, and Peter Rickers, of course, is the uh, technical director or the coaching director, I'm not sure what his term is, down at... Um, TD, yeah. TD. So he's he's everything, Ricker isn't he? At, down at Melville. Yeah, he's everything. So, but lucky to have him down at the club. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, uh, that, that's fantastic. I mean, Peter's been telling me this for years, you know, um, that they've never worked well together in the past. And now, <laughs> different CEO, different viewpoint, and it's, it's fantastic. And it, it's allowing the kids more kicks in the ball, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, especially they that are really keen on it. But yeah, it removes so some of the politics. It removes some of the politics. Um, probably enhances use of resources and a little bit of stress and anxiety too of parents and the kids about you know being told one thing and and not being able to do another thing and all those kind of things. I mean, we, that means we and we are talking about kids here too. We want to make the the passage through football as smooth as, as possible. As good a, a, yeah. an opportunity as as and, and an experience as possible. And by the way, David, um, I was at the AGM when you received your Life Membership Award. Congratulations, but you didn't have to get down on one knee. They weren't going to knight you, <laughs> David, you know what I mean? So I know that was a bit embarrassing when they said, get up, what are you kneeling down for? <laughs> but never mind. But congratulations, mate. Well done. Thanks very much, John. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean you can retire or anything now, though, Dave, all right? No, we'll, we'll hang in there. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. You got to, you got to see the uh, new facility at Murdoch to its fruition. So it's yeah. um, humming yeah. along nicely. Might yeah. take uh, one or two years. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and congratulations with your good work with Murdoch, mate. Mm. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate it. Yes, Dave, um, you do have a game today. Uh, yeah. So the club's using the John Connell Reserve in Leeming, which is Leeming Strikers Ground for the Men's State League Division Two games through the season again. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, it's a it's a great facility. I uh, really appreciate you know the fact that the council said it's been underutilized. Go and use it. But we also thank Leeming Strikers for uh, you know they look after the bar and everything for us, and uh, they you know they make us welcome down there. So it's really good. It's uh, working well together. It's sometimes helping one another, David. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And we're so close to one another anyway, you know. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, yeah. Never know what happens with the. With a Murdoch facility, when that's up and running, who wants to be a part of that and utilise well, those resources? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was talking to one person at the, the Rue Bowlers today, 
And he said, oh, you could have, you can be able to form two clubs now. You can do Mother University and Melville for all the Whitleys. Wow. And I said, well, yeah, that could be fine. He says, you could have another 350 kids up there. But what are we going to do with them when they get to 10 and 11, you know? Mm. It's, a, it's a fantastic thought. But how would we be able to, where, where, where would we play them? It's, uh, and it's just mad. It's I'm just sure mad. you'll find a spot, David. Yeah. yeah. These things will uh, unfold along the way. Yeah, it's 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 all good. Uh, there's a new club started down the road at Auburn Grove there, so yep, uh, that's going to take the pressure off. And I, I've told the guys down there that it's, it's, <laughs> it's great, you know, because take players, <laughs> take take some other players. No, it's just off, offering another facility. Yeah, and that's the growth <laughs> of, of you know the Perth urban area as it's moving down the freeway down south into all the, the rural and farming areas. It uh, yeah. means that there's going to be more clubs that will happen and in, in fill along the way to Rockingham and Mandurah and Bunbury. Yeah. Hmm. That's going to be a huge football area in yeah, the future. Yeah, it will. It will. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. No that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, down there, talking Rockingham, big game down there today. Rockingham are playing Forestfield United. Yep. Oh, beauty. That's a big clash down there at... Uh, I'll what? Pick that is the match of the round. I reckon. Yeah. I, I would think so, yeah. Rockingham sitting on yep. the top of the table and Forestfield are fifth. Yep. Yeah. So get all you Rockingham, beautiful day. All you Rockingham people, get down there and support your club and Forestfield. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. No, da- Dave, thanks so much for joining us today. Appreciate your time. Good luck Thank to the boys the Savo. Thanks, thanks for your kind words as well, John. Yeah, okay, not a problem, Dave. We'll, we'll talk about you when we get off here. <laughs> I can't you <laughs> Thanks for your time, Cheers, Dave. mate. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And, uh... That's a, that's a big plus, isn't it? it Murdoch. Massive. massive. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh... Because I remember a couple re- of seasons ago, you were... Oh, there was a lot of worry and what have you, and you couldn't get enough room for the kids and stuff like that, and now all of a sudden... But patience and the kids. It, I don't think the, the kids are. I mean, it's going to be a high quality surface. Mm. Okay, let's not forget that in summer it might get pretty darn hot, and when the programs and what that's going to need to play on grass. The kids will be playing on grass. It'll be the the high end users. I'm pretty sure will be using that new facility um, for fixtures anyway for competition. Like it'll be the NPL. Um, I keep saying NPL, but I mean the men's state league division two. They'll work their way up, um, and. The the junior NPL and uh, the women's they'll re- rebuild. They're going through rebuilding at the moment. So, um, John is Spears there a limitation and, open? Uh, I'd like to say uh, John Spear and uh, Danny Patch are doing a fantastic job helping the girls along there in their rebuilding phase down at Melville. Well done to those two. John, go ahead. No, I was going to say is is the a limitation now of what you can do? Have you reached? The limitations no. of how far you can go? If we're talking women's football, no. There's plenty of You know, scope. in general, like Melville, you know. Ah, uh, yeah. We we need... We, the ground Is this the last up. big step for you? I don't know. As a club, uh, uh, being able to maintain the quantity that you've got now, are you looking further ahead? Uh, I don't know. You have to ask the committee that mm, one. As, far, have as, saved that, as far as girls and women's football go... Um, there's a huge amount of growth that can, and we we were talking in our robust debate. I'm happy with that because the numbers that are coming into the club at the young age are really good. They're really good. I mean, that tells to me tells me that in another few years, when they get to the age of becoming young adults, they'll be playing. If we can retain them, um, then they'll be playing in our senior teams again, and the club will just naturally rebuild. And it's the, you know it's the likes of the the, the Danny Patches and the John. Spears who, who stay at the club and just want to help rebuild from the young ages that just that's why the girls hang around they've got the role models and they've got the coaches and the people that want to put the passion in you it's about all the volunteers John, could, could, we're going to go to a break okay and then we're going to come back and talk to how do you spell that Mike Cockle <laughs> okay and, we, and we've got that song number 17 here it goes for you Arsenal for the fans. Arsenal fans yep. out there FA Cup final tonight okay here we go
enough of that song. O'Connell, where did you get that from? My God, it wasn't what I was expecting. It's I got like, it out of the archives, oh. actually. Uh, and, you know, big game tonight, obviously. Uh, Arsenal versus Chelsea. And Arsenal, by the way, I think they've won out of the last four FA Cups. They've won three. So I would say they'd be favourites with a record like that. And poor old Arsene Wenger's had a hell of a season. Lots of critics and God knows what. So I think it'd be great to see uh, Arsene Wenger with the FA Cup in his hand and looking at all those people who give him a hard time this season and say, well, what about that? Good morning, Mike. How are you? Very good, thanks. There's plenty of gooners around, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> there is indeed, Michael. <laughs> there no, is I'm not indeed. one of them. I'm not one of them. I know. Sorry about that song. <laughs> uh, no, but... Um, and, and you support a Brazilian team, I believe, Michael. Yeah, look, I've, I've got a mate I've known for 20 years. He comes from Porto Alegre in Brazil. There's a team called Grêmio who... Yeah, I've heard of them. He chipped away at me, he chipped away at me, he chipped away at me, and he won in the end. So, uh, I guess I'm a Grêmio fan. Well, there you go, son, and Brazil's still producing some great players, aren't they? They are. In fact, Bobo, who played for Sydney FC, was a Grêmio player last year. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he's d he, he produced the goods for Sydney uh, on their way to uh, the championship this year. Um, just talking about that, uh, Tony Says is not happy, he's not a happy chappy with the fact that uh, Sydney FC wants to hold the, the championship final at, at Sydney on a regular basis, whether they're in it or not. What do you think of that one? Look, I don't know if that's Sydney FC personally pushing it. I think it's more like uh, the state government of New South Wales. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, there was a bit of uh, criticism, in fact, there was a lot of criticism about the state of playing surface for the grand final and uh, there's been this sort of ongoing issue over in Sydney about where does football sit in the pecking order because of course where Sydney FC play is used by uh, rugby league and rugby union as well and there's been this feeling that you know over many years despite the fact Sydney FC are now the, the most popular tenants of the ground that they don't get treated like that so all that was wrapped up into uh, the announcement by the New South Wales government that, well, you know what, we can solve this problem by by hosting it every year with plenty of notice. As we know with the system we have in the A-League, it's not really possible to tell a year <laughs> out where yeah. the grand final is going to be. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Tony gets a bit silly about it. He's still still desperate to get that grand final in Perth. Yeah, and, and we, we had the women's grand final. Funny enough, Michael, we had the WE grand final here in Perth. Yep. And it, was, it was a record crowd. And... Um, I was disappointed that the entourage didn't go and say hello to all the fans. They, for some reason, kept themselves apart. But, you know, it was great for Perth because, you know, we've been battling to get finals here over the years. And, you know, when you get the, the W League, it's, you know, you're not going to get hundreds of thousands or 20, 30,000. But, you know, to be able over here in little old Perth, you know, to set the record for the W uh, League fi Grand Final is fantastic. Yeah, I think we got, was yeah. it nearly 5,000. Yeah. Yep, and uh, look, you know, remember back in the NFL days, Subiaco and, you know, that yeah. was 40,000 plus crowds. We remember. Here, so. Hey, we but remember. those were the days, eh, hey, Michael? Those were the days, yeah, mate. mate. They are getting, they are getting uh, vaguer yeah. and vaguer, those memories, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they certainly are. But you've been uh, on the job as always, Michael. Uh, uh, an article that you wrote, um, you know, not that long ago in the Sydney Morning Herald. And uh, it's about the way the game is being run here. And, you know, you've been around, I've been around. And I, I just get to the stage where you, you just got that feeling, well, enough is enough. You know, when are you going to appreciate what people have done over some, all those years? Not only the players, the journalists, all those people who put their time in. Like you said, when you watch some of the games we've had to watch, and we're talking the grand final, uh, we, we were talking when Greece came over here and played the Socceroos. I mean, when are we going to have to still put up with these kind of situations in our game? Look, um, uh, there is a general uh, disappointment about the FFA running of the game at the moment. Um, the sad thing, if you've been around long enough, is it, it, it seems familiar. It, it seems like the mood that was in the game before Frank Lowy made his comeback. Yeah. And if you are, you know, someone who has the game at heart, as opposed to particular self-interest or whatever, mm -hmm. you don't want to go back there. So what we want from the FFA, pretty well 99.9% .9 of the stakeholders in the game, is some form of leadership and some type of strategy. Because the issues that, you know, in front of the game now, expanding the A-League, a, a national second division, um, football development, you know, these are really um, passionate issues. 
among people who are passionate about the game. Don't and you... All we get from the FFA when we talk about this is, oh, just wait, you know, we're working on it. We're going to get another consult. Wait another couple of years. Well, not good enough anymore. People are, are very frustrated, and I think all the people, including me, uh, who've been prepared to be incredibly patient with the lower regime for a lot of years, are now saying, well, you know, the patience is starting to run out. Let's do something. Mike, don't you think the whole of football plan that came out, I can't remember if it was one or two years ago now. About three, I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that that was a strategy. Well, it was, it gave some pretty good ideas of where we wanted to get to, maybe not a strategy and how to get to them. And then resources allocated to it was, I don't know, it was all very confusing. It, it looked good when it came out and then it was like, oh, well, how are we going to get there? Yeah, well, the 20-year plan was, you know, um, I guess uh, a lot of motherhood statements, a lot about, yeah, it'd be nice to have 20,000 average crowds in the A-League and it'd be nice to have 100,000 qualified coaches through the system and it'd be nice to have, you know, um, 300,000 registered women's players and whatever else. I can't remember the exact uh, targets, but well, we do want those things. Then they came out 18 months later with the four to five year action plan, which is how we're going to action the whole of football plan and nothing happened either. So people are just getting tired of the excuses and I think people are getting uh, incredibly disillusioned with the lack of um, just direction and you know there's a whole lot of issues that get people worked up and, and the FFA just seem to be paralysed and I don't like saying that, and as someone who's been around for a long time, I don't like the fact that it gives me these disturbing memories of a past era of the game, you know, when similar issues were around and similar frustrations were around. And But sadly, we, we're almost back to that type of situation with almost universal, um, you know, frustration, disillusionment, disappointment, opposition to the regime that's running our game. should never have got to this stage. Mike, there's a lot of, uh, at this time of year, in between our seasons, the A-League season, the W-League season, yep. there's a lot of international fixtures that happen uh, as friendlies and uh, pre-game, oh, pre-competition friendlies for EPL teams and whatever coming here and there. And Australia has been a bit of a landing platform for many different teams, the Intercon- Intercontinental Challenge Cup or whatever it's called, um, EPL, uh, Chelsea, Arsenal, Brazil's coming here. I mean, I, I get quite excited at those names and the opportunity to visit uh, somewhere in my own country a pretty quality team. Um, I've, there's been a bit of banter in the media in the last couple of weeks about whether that's a good thing or not, whether it's hypocritical, whether it harms our football community, what it brings. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I made my feelings pretty clear about a week ago on the Herald, actually, which, you know, was basically that, you know, why don't people address the legacy issue? We are, we are compromising the authenticity of our own game. And it's not about all these games. Um, for instance, Australia are playing Brazil, uh, in Melbourne in a, you know, in a couple of weeks. And that's great as far as I'm concerned, because it involves our national team against the Brazilian team, which has a few stars missing, but will still be incredibly competitive. So that's a legitimate game for me. The games like the other night with Liverpool playing Sydney FC, similar types of games in the past, the International Champions Cup, ITC tournament. I mean, these are blatant cash grabs by overseas promoters uh, and overseas competitions. And I guess the EPL is the worst culprit if you look at it from this type of view because they do this all over the world. And I guess the best way to answer what you know, uh, the legitimacy of these games are is when you look at the breakdown of who makes what. Yep. And, you know, I would suggest Liverpool have now played four games in four years in Australia and pulled about twenty twenty two million dollars out of the local market, whereas the four A League clubs which have provided the opposition have pulled less than one million between them. How can, that? How can we change that? Incredible difference. How can we change that? Because I mean, it's, it's a great opportunity, though, don't you think? If we could somehow change that to benefit us. Well, of course, and that's where we have to stand up our own game, like Japan do. And I've been going about this for years. It's the inspiration, the, the model, the, the 
the, the example that the A-League should follow in growing this competition is in Japan, nowhere else. The J-League don't grab cash. They don't take quick sugar hits. They are looking beyond the horizon. They are looking at long-term evolution of their game. So they don't cop any of this. You don't go to Japan for the foreign club. Yeah. But they, 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 had a, they had a 20-year plan as well, Michael, they didn't they? They had a 100-year plan. <laughs> yeah. Believe it you know. And, you know, they'll win in the end. Yeah, they will. It won't take 100 years. They'll win in the end because what people in, those, in Japan will do is respect their own competition and their own players and their own coaches. And we should be following that example. But we take the cash, including the FFA, who get a sanction for you every time they approve these games. Yeah. Everyone just grabs the cash. And the long term is, you know, there's another generation of kids who've gone to these Premier League whose allegiance is now with foreign clubs and not with the local club. Yeah, well, you mentioned that you mentioned about Liverpool and, and obviously we've had a number of teams, Real Madrid, Tottenham, all these teams have been coming to Australia. And, and that's been my, my, my thoughts have been, you know, that's fine, but what, how much of that money that these teams are obviously getting comes back into our game here well, in Australia? It actually stays here. And Peter. stays here. Mm. Peter. It is, isn't it? And, and, and you did say, you were saying many of those who are running our sport have become complacent and narrow-minded and, and, that, uh, and that the suits and the boots have never been so far apart. Uh, give us an insight on the suits and the boots, uh, just for the benefit of our listeners, what you see as the suits and the boots. Well, I guess that's the way of saying that the people that run the game, and it's not just football, it's AFL, rugby league, rugby union cricket, you know, the, the people that run these games and manage these games have lost sight of what they are actually doing. So what we've got in football is the management and the board that is so focused on the bottom line, so focused on TV deals, so focused on sponsorships for the top level of the game, so obsessed with, you know, the metrics, that they don't understand that below those metrics is the vast majority of our game. We are the one sport, and I mean the one sport in Australia, that has this huge, huge reservoir of people at the grassroots and into the sort of semi-pro uh, level of the game, who are disconnected, completely disconnected with the top level of the game because the top level of the game hasn't engaged them, doesn't know how to engage them, doesn't want to engage them, and we are wasting this incredible opportunity to to capitalise on that, to monetise it, to, to, to exploit it, to create a national second division, for example. There's so many things that football can do that no other sport can do because we have at least twice as many participants as the next biggest sport in Australia. And, you know, 99% of those people, who are the boots, I call them, have no connection with the suits. It's incredibly fun. Is that a battle of, of the, uh, business and culture? Well, in my humble opinion, um, sport generally has lost its way in the last 30 years, you know, 20 years, because cable television has just inflated the top level of all professional sport around the world, so far beyond, uh, you know, common sense. Yeah. That, you know, um, that seems to be the only level of a sport which people, you know, talk about. Well, no, no, there's, there's, there's a great level of sport which is still about participants who, who, who deserve to be engaged. And as I said, in Australia, in football, there's, you know, the figure is, 75 to 78% of participants in football in Australia are not connected to the A-League. Well, and, and, and one of the biggest losers, Michael, uh, especially here in Western Australia, I'm sure it's the same round Australia, is the football family. The cost exactly. factors are, are coming right into their pockets. I mean, if, if we didn't have the football family here in Western Australia, we wouldn't have any money. Hmm. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So can I ask why the intercontinental oh, inter the what, international championship? Yeah, the ICC. Thank you. Yeah. I have to say ICC. Good on you, Ben. Yeah. Um, why did that get called well, off? Well, they basically weren't happy with the profits they made last year. Right. They were excited by the first year when Cristiano Ronaldo came with Real Madrid and Manchester City came, and first crowd was eighty five, eighty two thousand. Second crowd was 
a fraction shy of 100,000. And everyone got excited. The Victorian government signed a four-year deal. But they came back uh, last year with Atletico Madrid, Tottenham Hotspur and Juve. And they are nowhere near as big a draw card. And the crowd didn't measure up. The interest wasn't there. The ratings for television weren't there. So they dumped it. They've gone to Singapore. So it was a four-year deal, and a two-year deal, which probably illustrates my point. I think that really when you scratch the surface, the only motivation for so many of these games is money. Yes. You know, because if they were not about money, they would have hung in there for a couple of tough years and, you know, got on with it. But they yes. sort of jumped ship. Yeah. So let's talk about the Socceroos. Uh, yep. There's a game coming up June 8th, a little yep. World Cup qualifying game against uh, Saudi Arabia. Oh, big one, not a little one. Yeah, I know, I know. Here in Australia, so I'm not sure if tickets are still available. That one's sold out, Adelaide. actually. Adelaide Oval. It's in Adelaide, yeah. Yep. And the squad's just been picked by the boss. Yep. And there's a handful of uncapped players in there. A couple of brothers, one of which is capped and one of which isn't. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, Ryan and Dylan McGow. Well, Dylan's yeah. been playing pretty well for Adelaide for two years in a row. He's just joined a Portuguese club. Um, I think he's a decent player. Um, maybe be better than his brother, to be honest. Um, so, But this is a 30-man squad, which is going to get trimmed to 23, I think, next week. Yep. Um, don't know if he'll make the cut, but... Um, yeah, look, Ange, he's always looking around. Um, he has used a lot of players over... His game in charge. Um, I think he's on record as saying, "Okay, the experimentation stops now because it's fair income time, which it is. The next six months are massive, absolutely massive for the national team. There's not only qualifying for the World Cup, of course, but there's the Confederations Cup in Russia. So, you know, these are big games for the Socceroos. So, he obviously wants to do well with them. So, you know, that's what he's saying and. When we boil down the 30-man squad, maybe some of those fringe players might drop off, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, and looking at uh, what we were talking about earlier, it really puts that kind of pressure on Ange now because we haven't got any money anyway. But, you know, if we're, if, if we're going to still maintain our credibility and what have you, then obviously we need to qualify for the 2018 World Cup. But the thing is, Michael, when we come back from World Cups, and we've come back from a few now, are we better off in, in all aspects of, of, of the game, which we should be for, for having that kind of experience? Oh, yeah, look, you can, there's no downside to playing in a World Cup, apart from anything else. The FFA pockets 12 million US every time we qualify, so yeah. there, is, there is no downside. Um, it's only positive. Um, I don't think qualifying for the World Cup is a game changer for the game as a whole in Australia that it was, say, yeah. in 2006 and 2010. And that's probably because the A-League is further down the track and more entrenched and, you know, uh, a lot of the money that comes into the FFA's coffers now, or probably 90% of it now, is unrelated to the Socceroos. So, you know, the Socceroos succeeding isn't, you know, the be-all and end-all that it used to be, but... There's only good things to gain out of qualifying. and Look, in a way, I'm actually quite happy that we are doing it tough in qualifying because, you know, Asia is getting better in certain countries. We have a, what I believe is a very average generation of players. And, you know, in a way, I want us to qualify quite, quite obviously, but I'd be pretty happy if we snuck in at the last moment yeah. just to sort of, I don't know, uh, just to sort of make everyone aware that, you know, we've got to work harder at producing better players and just to focus everything back on the quality of the footballers coming through rather than get all tied up in all the other stuff that I've been talking about. And, and those are the areas we should be being rewarded for, but we're not. So, it, as you said, you know, the World Cup is the thing, the catalyst that, that brings all of a sudden all this together and, and shows the importance of making sure that we qualify. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, why have we got an average generation of players, if you believe that, which I do? Because the development system is either broken or, or struggling. So It hasn't worked, has it? Somehow get the, the focus back on that, yeah. and people start to work out how we can solve that and turn it around, and that's a good thing. 
Um, Mike, before we let you go, we've just got a few minutes left, but I just wanted to get your comments on the FFA Cup. We're going through all the round stages in our respective states at the moment and uh, cream's rising to the top. Do you think the the profile of the Cup is, is doing what it was designed to do? And Oh, look, this is, this is the big success story of our game uh, in the A-League era. The A-League getting started was huge, but this is the biggest thing since the A-League kicked off 12 years ago. I mean, it's just 750, 760 teams entered this year. I mean, everyone was part of it. It's just such a brilliant competition. You know, I've been lucky enough to travel all around and go to games in funny places like Devonport. And you uh, love it, Michael. <laughs> you love it, mate. Yes, I love it. I love it. It's just it's, it's what I'm talking about. This is the grassroots. <laughs> and brilliant. you know what, Michael? That will become one of the biggest, if not the biggest competition in Australia in years to come. I think it will. I think it will. And it's just taken up. And the good thing about this is, and this proves my point, you don't need suits and, and marketing people and mm, everyone yeah. else to sort of steer us in the right direction. We know it's the right direction. Yeah, and you should. Sort of release a bit of the passion. And look what happened. And this is what the FFA Cup is. It's a fantastic competition. We absolutely love it at Fox Sports. It rates the house down. And, you know, people can't get enough of it. You know, they just cannot get enough of it. So and, and, uh, I'm loving it. I noticed in the last round here is that some of the local clubs here in Perth uh, got some sponsorship happening and got the stream live, got a commentator and put it on YouTube, which was fantastic. Yep, that's what it's doing. That's what it's doing. Yeah, but we'd, ra- we'd rather see you there doing it, Michael, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'd rather be there, believe it, I love it. <laughs> I know I you it. with you, bugger. You love flying around Australia, Michael. <laughs> oh, I like it in Perth, you know that. And, and I'm still waiting for you to buy me a coffee here in Perth, by the way. I think I bought you one down that stairs while on the grandstand. Did you? Are you sure, Mike? Uh, well, it, if you did, I'd give you the money to pay for it. <laughs> No, you didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, we've got to let you go. Appreciate your time today. Enjoy the banter. Thank you. My pleasure. Michael, you're a good lad. Thank you. We'll catch you. up with you again. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Here we go. Bye. Advice on. That was Mike uh, Cockrell. Just quickly, Penn, um, for people who know Jimmy Mayers, Jimmy Mayers passed away down in Bunbury uh, on the weekend. And his family said that if anybody would, because Jimmy was well known in Bunbury and also here with his coaching courses and that, if anybody would like to come down on Friday, the 2nd of June, um, that's when the funeral will be held. Okay, and uh, we're off to visit uh, Sid Smith and Sandra Shopsky this afternoon, two legends of the game, women's football. Yeah, well, um, you know, we've got to let this lad in to do his music now. We do, Bags Groove. Lenny Brush. Coming up next. Yep. Lenny? And John, thank you very much. Not and a problem. Everyone else, thank and you for Rosie. listening in. And Rose for yep. doing the women's fixtures for us. Got to always keep the women's football fixtures happening. Next week, more football. I'm back in the studio from 10 o'clock. See you then. Take care. Oh, by the way, don't forget, we're on YouTube now, actually, and there'll be more shows loaded. Oh, really? On-